Well, good morning, everyone. It's my pleasure today to um, introduce uh, Dr. Hala Sahali from St. Kitts Nevis. Uh, she is going to give us a talk today on nature-based approaches for watershed management in the Caribbean. Um, luckily, I've had the pleasure to, to uh, meet uh, Hala uh, at a few um, conferences in the Caribbean and just recently completed a project with uh, Dr. Chris Metcalf and myself. We worked on a project with her in St. Kitts. So uh, just a little bit of background on Hala. Uh, Dr. Hala Saheli is an environmental engineer with many years uh, experience in the area of water resource management. Hala was the first uh, female manager of water engineer and water of the Water Service Department of St. Kitts from 2013 to 2014, after having served as assistant water engineer in charge of strategic planning and capital projects for over five years. She managed various projects, including the expansion of the chlorination, chlorination program, state-of-the-art mapping of the entire water system, and several other projects related to integrated water resource management. She coordinated the effort to have the vulnerable well field zone of the Bassetere Valley Aquifer declared a protected area. And she received her PhD in environmental engineering from the University of Toronto in 2006. Currently, she is, she is a licensed engineer in the province of Ontario, Canada, and has served on the executive board of the Caribbean Water and Wastewater Association as vice president from 2008 to 2010. With that, Hella, um, you can go ahead and share the screen and uh, we look forward to your talk. Thanks, thanks, Aaron. I, uh, can you see my screen? How does that look? It's good. Yeah, great. Um, so I'll, I'll just keep my video on a little bit as I introduce this topic and then I'll, I'll probably switch it off just, just to make sure we have a sufficient bandwidth um, good morning, colleagues. I'm, I'm really pleased today uh, to be presenting about the IW Eco Project uh, in St. Kitts I know my, my title talk had fairly generic title, but we're going to zoom in today and I'm going to talk about nature-based solutions that were applied um, to land restoration um, in St. Kitts and Nevis. And this was done under the IW Eco Project, which is um, a regional project the full name of the project is Integrating Water, Land, and Ecosystems Management in Caribbean Small Island States. So uh, again, very pleased to be here for this online seminar series. Uh, welcome, you know, your questions at, at the end. I'll try to keep it, you know, pretty short and interesting. And um, really look forward to having a good discussion at the end. Okay, so I'll just stop my video and then I'll, I'll keep moving on. Uh, okay, here we go. So I'll start with an introduction to the IW Eco Project, and then I'll go through uh, what it exactly means, you know, to be implementing nature-based solutions. And I'll give examples of how uh, we implemented on the ground in St. Kitts and Nevis various types of nature-based solutions under this project. And you know, while we were while we were implementing this project, um, especially kind of midway through the COVID nineteen pandemic, because we were implementing really during kind of the course of the pandemic, we became really interested in looking at adaptive management and just kind of assessing how well we were doing, and especially as we we go from midterm uh, till the end of a project. And so at this point, I, I became familiar with uh, the, a global standard that was had just been developed by the IUCN, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, which I think many of you would be familiar with. They just um, in 2020 had developed this global standard for nature-based solutions. So I became kind of interested in that and, and how well we were doing according to this particular standard. So it's a bit of exploratory work that we've been doing as we kind of wrap up our project and, and try to assess how well we're doing. So I'm gonna talk about um, you know, this tool that was developed by IUCN and the eight different criteria and 28 indicators. And I'm kind of gonna go through a self-assessment um, with kind of a bit of a focus on adaptive management because this became kind of a strong um, area uh, for us to focus on, especially during the pandemic. And then I'll go through some concluding remarks. So an introduction to IW Eco. Here you can see our website. There's lots of information on our website about this project. 
Uh, it's multifocal regional project with 10 participating countries in the Caribbean. It's funded by the GEF, the Global Environment Facility, is implemented by UNEP and uh, many different partners, including UNDP um, and other regional agencies, the OECS Commission and CARFA. Uh, in St. Kitts and Nevis, this project is being implemented by the Department of Environment. It was originally designed to be a four-year project, but ended up being on the ground more of a three-year project. And our funding from the GEF is just under 1 million US dollars. And the kind of main goal of the project in St. Kitts and Nevis was to facilitate pilot nature-based solution interventions um, in various locations, in St. Kitts, in the College Street gut watershed, and in Nevis at key quarry sites and nearby wetlands and coral reefs. I'm gonna speak a lot more about that as we move forward. So what is this IW Eco approach or what type of approach were we hoping to apply to all these different, um, you know, for all these participating countries, kind of what is our overarching guiding principles? So the IW Eco approach is meant to be like an integrative approach, one that focuses on systems, people, and values. Um, systems meaning whole ecosystems such as watersheds uh, and focus on the relationship and processes within the system. And nature-based solutions, of course, speaks a lot to this. Uh, people, it ensures intersectoral cooperation and stakeholder engagement. And then of course, values. We know that our environment provides us with important and valuable benefits, which we call ecosystems, goods, and services. And these support all of life and they seek, uh, we should be seeking to enhance the sharing of these benefits. So uh, many of the interventions taken on the ground um, in St. Kitts and Nevis, and also in some of the, in many of the other countries are actually nature-based solutions. Although we didn't really, I mean, when you read through the project document, they weren't necessarily tagged or um, labeled as nature-based solutions. Um, but when you really look at this definition for nature-based solutions that was um, developed or kind of um, focused in on by the IUCN in 2016, I, we came to realize that, yeah, a lot of what we're doing, a lot of this restoration work, um, reforestation work, these were all uh, nature-based solutions. These were all actions to protect sustainably manage and restore natural or modified ecosystems. So in our case, it was generally modified ecosystems that address societal challenges effectively and adaptively while simultaneously providing human well-being and biodiversity benefits. I think we could all agree um, that this definition kind of makes sense and it's, you know, encompasses everything that you, you would think when you use the term nature-based solution. So uh, as I noted in 2020, the IUCN as a means of verification, design, and upscaling of NBS um, solutions came up with this global standard. The standard comprises eight criteria and 28 associated indicators. So you can find the full standard um, right here at this web link. And of course we can share all this information and everything I've learned about this standard. I, I basically learned from these guidance documents. I didn't attend any training. Um, it, was, it was just that I went through these documents and, and they really spoke to us as a way of um, assessing you know, where we were and how effective we were being in the implementation of IW Eco on the ground. And this is kind of, uh, gives us a snapshot of, uh, of the global standard and its eight criteria. Uh, criteria one and two, and I'm gonna speak more about these um, a little further along in, in the presentation, but just as a kind of a brief overview, uh, criteria one and two um, speak to identifying societal challenges that need to be addressed. Oh, sorry. And um, how to design an appropriate uh, nature-based solution at scale. Criteria three, four, and five correspond to the three dimensions of sustainable development, all of which were, you know, very familiar with the triple bottom line, environmental sustainability, economic viability, and social equity. While a criterion six, seven, and eight speak to resilient project management and the mainstreaming and sustainability of the solutions, uh, within various frameworks, policy frameworks, institutional frameworks. So when I get to the part where we're going through each of these criteria, I'll speak to each of them a little bit more uh, in a bit more detail. But now let's talk about what we did, what we did in St. Kitts and Nevis. So 
um, what type of nature-based solutions did we implement here? And I'm going to speak about several of them. I'm going to start with St. Kitts and Nevis, uh, the island of St. Kitts, the College Street gut. Uh, a gut, if you're not familiar with this term, is basically a ravine, a natural drainage channel. Um, and in this, uh, this is a fairly large gut or watershed um, in St. Kitts. It's the largest, over 600 hectares. And there's been lots of land use changes in this area due to urban growth, which have resulted in uh, lots of changes, um, more rapid surface water runoff, severe soil erosion following um, intense rainfall events. And so this was identified uh, by the government of St. Kitts as an area that needed um, some work and land degradation control works. And so it was taken on by the IW Eco Project. So in early 2020, there was a diagnostic kind of assessment and vulnerability assessment. And we chose kind of a small intervention area within the wider gut, because it's quite large, as I told you. So we chose a five acre um, area in which to take some interventions and pilot uh, nature-based solution. So we started with cleaning up of solid waste and removal of invasive plants. And we used um, one of our main kind of interventions was the installation of gabion baskets. These are kind of wire mesh baskets that are filled with various sizes of stones and are used to stabilize, um, you know, river banks, uh, ravine banks in this case, and is basically shown over, you know, this is widely used all over the world and had been already utilized in St. Kitts and Nevis as well as being quite effective against soil erosion, especially on the banks. We also prepared two weir structures. So already in this area where we decided to take our intervention, there were these uh, wall kind of retaining wall structures that go across the ravine, which were meant to act as barriers to retain excessive soil runoff. So some of these structures uh, needed repair, especially to their spillways. And so that those repairs were done. And um, our last, oh, two other things that we did in this, in this kind of intervention area was to remove, so uh, as the water is flowing through this gut uh, intermittently, it's, it's, not, it's, it's not a perennial stream and it just happens when it rains. Um, every, a lot of the soil ends up kind of at the outlet, which is this bay right in the middle of our main town, which is named Basterre. And so we did some cleanup at the outlet as well. So we did that two or three times. And uh, the first time we did it, we removed over 500 metric tons of sediments. And then the next time we did it, it was 350. Um, and the third time, which I didn't indicate here, was a, a similar amount. And so you can see kind of anecdotally that over the lifetime of this project, less soil um, is having to be dredged from the outlet. And so we can kind of, you know, um, say that some of these interventions are already being, you know, are already kind of bearing fruit, as it were. And the last thing that we did was the planting of deep-rooted vetiver grass. Um, many of you may be familiar with this type of grass. It has different names in different countries. Here, it's also called couscous um, bed grass. Um, I'm sure it has other names in Asian countries as well. But this is a type of grass that has a very, very deep root system and is very, very good at um, uh, soil stabilization. And so we were able to plant over 500 clumps of, of this grass along the banks of this um, gut. So here are some photographs. Uh, here you can see on, on the left, uh, some of the gabion, this is actually the largest section where we put in gabion baskets. This is, this is the last natural segment of this gut before it enters the main town, and then it becomes a concrete drainage channel. So it was really important to, to do some work here because in the past, there's been quite a bit of impacts from flooding during intense rainfall. Um, and then you can see repairs to the spillway on one of these weirs right here on, on the right-hand side photograph. Here you see photos of um, the planting of vetiver grass. So the first photo is um, what we first initially did about two and a half years ago. The middle photo is after one year of growth. And the third photo, I meant to go get a better photo, but I didn't have enough time, um, is showing growth of the vetiver grass after two and a half years. So it grows very well. The grass can be utilized for numerous purposes um, for enhancing livelihoods, such as basket weaving, or uh, also I know in some countries they make essential oil out of it as well. 
So moving on to our next, um, so that's one nature-based solution that we implemented in, in SyncKits. And then moving on to Nevis now, we took interventions at three different sites, and these were facilitated by an NGO. We worked very closely with an NGO named the Nevis Historical and Conservation Society. And they've been doing a lot of this work over the years, and so they were like a natural partner for us. And they also work with community groups on the ground in Nevis. And so one of the first sites we, we decided to take an intervention at was at a site named Coconut Walk at New River Estate. This is downstream of some active quarries. And so there's been kind of persistent land degradation at this site over numerous decades, due mostly to overgrazing on uh, unsustainable farming practices, and of course, uh, these upstream quarry operations that I spoke to. So this is a site that the NHCS was already working on. They had received some previous funding from a small grants program, and we decided that they were doing some really incredible work there and that we would help fund the continuation of the work. So this site was fully contoured with berms to restrict erosion, under which swales were developed for water attention. There were sediment traps, small catchment areas, all of these constructed throughout the site, uh, over 10 acres, um, to aid in water retention and vegetation regrowth, including cactus gardens and uh, all types of different uh, types of plants. There was small scale composting was developed at the site to promote soil nutrient health as well. Uh, one element uh, of this that we really had to pay a lot of attention to was fencing. And this was mostly as a deterrent from feral animals or even um, it's, uh, it's in a farming area. So there's a lot of kind of free roaming cattle and livestock. And so we had to be really careful because as you're planting, the, you know, this is easy for them to eat. And so we had to spend some, some resources on, on, on fencing. So over the two years, uh, they planted a lot of native species that are very drought tolerant because this is in the driest part of Nevis. And it happened to be in the middle of quite a long standing drought. And it's very windswept location. I mean, you're really struck by it when you go there. It's very windy. There's a lot of sea blast. And so they tried to plant, you know, these types of species that are drought tolerant and it could tolerate also some salt. So native sea grape, coconut, almond trees, also vetiver grass, um, and a variety of fruit trees as well. So over 2000 trees that were planted over about two year period. Um, so I spoke to some of the kind of the mitigating circumstances, but only 731 trees survived, uh, which is just a survival rate of about 36%. And there's a lot that we learned from this site, but um, it is very challenging to work in. And it really required probably more consistent um, water source. So most of these plants were just rain fed. And like I told you, it was during a quite a sustained drought. And so there were efforts made to do a kind of more consistent irrigation, but it was really, really quite challenging. And that can account mostly for the survival rate. So here are some photos, aerial photos. You can see the berms and how the, the site was kind of contoured in order to take a full advantage of any rainfall that was falling on the site. And you can see these swales here. Um, and here you see Mr. Amory in the middle. He's our, our head kind of project manager for the NHCS, working tirelessly at these sites with a fairly small crew of people. Um, you can see some coconut trees. I'm here on the left planting a flamboyant tree, which is the national tree of St. Kitts and Nevis which I don't think survived, ironically, that one. Uh, but the coconut trees have done quite well. Um, sea grape has done well and almond. But when you visit the site, you're quite struck that a lot of these trees are not able to grow up uh, because of the wind. They tend to kind of grow horizontally. So moving on to the next site, um, this was a site where we decided to do reforestation work at an abandoned quarry at Potworks Estate. So this was over about five acres. Quarrying operations ceased at this site uh, over 10 years ago, but no restoration efforts had been um, kind of undertaken. So it left a kind of denuded, exposed hillside prone to severe erosion after heavy rainfall. And so there was a proliferation of invasive species as well, kasha, um, cattails in some kind of more boggy areas. Um, it was abandoned. Um, like there was abandoned equipment everywhere and it had become a hotspot for illegal dumping. And so this site took just, it took us one whole year just to really clean up this site, remove invasive species and prepare the land for reforestation activities. Like 
I really didn't know how we were going to do it initially, but uh, for a very persistent effort by NHCS, working with uh, numerous partners, government partners, as well as community partners, they managed this uh, cleanup effort. And then over the last year of the project, we're able to plant over 1,000 trees. And in this case, um, they decided to have a stronger focus on agroforestry. Um, and this was as a means of trying to get community buy-in, you know, that in the future there was going to be these, you know, mango trees and breadfruit trees and guinep and all of these kind of local native species. We were a bit more successful here in terms of uh, the survival rates. So over the one year of planting, we've had a survival rate of 47%. Um, and so the work continues at this site, but mostly on a volunteer basis until the NHCS is able to secure additional funding. So here are some photos. So the picture on the left shows kind of what we found when we reached. Um, the top photo is after that year of kind of cleaning up and preparing the land. So you can see what we were met, what we met. We met a very kind of uh, no nutrients in the soil, very low soil fertility. Um, they did bring in some, some compost from the other site and some, some uh, topsoil as well. Um, and then you can see this picture taken just a few weeks ago because um, we did just get a nice amount of rainfall. And um, you can see some cordia trees. I don't know if anybody's familiar with those. Those are on the right-hand side. Um, uh, a lot of uh, gooseberries, uh, sea grapes, pomegranate. These are all doing quite well and thriving at the site right now. So my final uh, thing that I'd like to talk about in Nevis, the third site, was a uh, restoration of a coastal wetland. And this was at Nelson Springs. It was over about five to eight acres. This one wasn't originally part of our plan for IW Eco, but there was very strong kind of community um, buy-in and they really wanted us to take an in intervention here. And so we decided to invest a small amount of money to at least do a pilot study here. This coastal wetland and many of the coastal wetlands in Nevis uh, are subject to a lot of uh, negative environmental pressures and they've all been cut off from one another. And so this whole area of Nelson Spring, which has kind of a long historical um, background as well that maybe we could speak to about uh, Nelson. Um, but the pond itself, so it has an open water aspect and this whole pond had been colonized by a very rigorous type of cattail, this Southern cattail, I think Taifa has like a long scientific name. And so it used to be this beautiful pond that was open, uh, an open aspect and you could see the ocean, uh, but then it was fully colonized by this invasive, this invasive cattail. And so the NHCS together with a local community group worked uh, very hard to remove this invasive species in one area of the wetland. It was really meant to be a bit of a pilot to see kind of what would work and what wouldn't work. And so they were able to remove a lot of the, the cattail in one area of the pond and kind of a, a buffer zone around it. And when they started to remove it, they found clumps of coconut trees. And they also did some replanting of mangrove, swamp ferns, and other native species. And what was interesting is as soon as we were able to open up the area a little bit, there was very quickly return of kind of native biodiversity, native spike reeds, water lilies, also crabs, butterflies. Um, we took a group of birders there. Um, some of them had just completed the training and they identified over 30 species of birds um, in and around uh, the spring in the wetland, which was really amazing. Um, so you can see here a picture on the left when they first uh, removed some of the cattails and they did this with mechanical kind of equipment. Some of it was done by hand. Um, so this is what it looked like uh, when they first completed the work. And then, like I said, within a month or two, you could see spike reed, sedges. These are kind of pictured on the right. Now, they've encountered some issues since you know, doing this. The cattail has been very, very difficult to control. Um, but I'm happy to report that the NHCS, based on this pilot activity, received additional funding from the US Forest Service. And so they're now using mechanical reed cutters and some other approaches to try to really uh, have a concerted effort at keeping this invasive species under control. So the story is still out on this one and I can report back hopefully you know, in the future. Um, we also took some marine-based, nature-based solutions, uh, kind of some, some actions in the marine zone as well, in the coastal zone uh, in both St. Kitts and Nevis. And these activities focused on increasing uh, kind of the capacity 
for the government as well as kind of private stakeholders and NGOs to do coral reef monitoring and restoration. And it took a kind of, we did like a four prong approach. We did a camera survey at selected coral reefs. We did lots of training in coral reef monitoring. Over 150 persons were exposed to this training and there was strong focus on youth. We were able to establish our first coral nursery. And this was done um, by a rather new NGO called Care SKN. And the focus on this nursery was on branching corals, Acropora, the Acropora species. Uh, I'm not gonna spend too much time. Marine is not really my, my, my expertise, but we, we can talk about it a bit more and I'll show some photos. We also did the installation of some artificial reefs um, and we used the more reef modules. And this was developed in a neighboring island of the Netherlands Antilles, very close actually to St. Kitts and an island named Saber. And these were developed by Dr. Hilkima of the University of Applied Science, Van Hal Laurenstein, and he's based in Saber. And so we purchased this kind of um, mold and we're, we were able to um, construct the, the modules. It's like a stacking, stacking type of modules. And we were able to install 12 modules at three separate locations. I'm gonna show some photos. And early monitoring is quite promising. And we're seeing a lot of marine life that's been attracted to these artificial reefs. So here you can see the more reef modules and you can see how it's based on like a layered cake design, has lots of kind of holes and nooks and crannies for marine life to kind of take hold. And here you can see them installing at one location. So three at the base, one at the top. And this leaves kind of, future, I mean, lots of space for, for future expansion of, of the artificial reef. Here we see some of the work I spoke to that CARE SKN did in the establishment of the coral nursery. Um, you can see here Valerie, she's one of the co-founders of CARE with the, uh, the, the fragments, and you can see them installing it on the tree, what they call a coral tree. They established three of these trees. And also happy to report that CARE SKN is um, also receiving additional funding to continue this work based on the pilot work they did under IWECO. So these are the, I mean, kind of briefly, as briefly as I could do it, <laughs> uh, the nature-based solutions that we applied in St. Kitts and Nevis. We did a lot of other work as well on management plans, updating of water quality monitoring protocols, um, and a number of other things um, that I'll speak to a little bit under criterion eight. But now I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of go through how we applied this, the IUCN self-assessment tool. And um, yeah, I, wa I wanted to see kind of in applying the tool, how well did we adhere to these eight criteria? And I really I viewed it as a kind of a bit of an exploratory type of assessment, you know? I, it, it wasn't really meant to be a very strict evaluation, but really like uh, it's, it was so nicely set up in a very systematic way. Um, I, I thought it could be very helpful and very useful to identify the strengths and weaknesses of, of you know, what we've done on the ground here. So I'm gonna go through criteria by criteria and some of the indicators and just speak um, fairly briefly to each of them and how well we did in a sense. So they utilize a bit of like a traffic light system. So for each indicator, you basically have a choice of if you were strong, adequate, if you met the, the indicator strong in a strong way, um, whether it was adequately met, a partially met, or insufficiently met. Insufficient is, you know, red. And if you met it in a very strong way, it was kind of like a deeper green. So for each indicator, so criterion one speaks to effectively addressing societal challenges. And I mean, these challenges for IUCN are like climate change, disaster risk reduction, economic and social development, human health, food security, water security, and environmental degradation and biodiversity loss. And for any of you who might've worked on Jeff projects, the Jeff has very similar type of uh, focal areas. And so, we did do a lot of work in the design phase of this project um, on kind of address um, identifying which challenges are you really seeking to, um, you know, apply these solutions to. And for and so for our project, it was mostly related to environmental degradation and biodiversity loss, but we also focused on um, disaster risk reduction and water security. And so if you look at some of these indicators, so for example, indicator 1.1, the most pressing societal challenges and for beneficiaries and holders are prioritized. And I gave this that we adequately, you know, 
And here are some of the guiding you know, questions. So these are the questions you ask yourself while you're going through the self-assessment. And so basically, um, all of these you know, are, all, are all related, these indicators. And generally speaking, like I told you, there's a very long design period for Jeff projects. And there's a lot of stakeholder consultation. And there's a very detailed project document, you know, all of this is happening well before, you know, anything is happening on the ground. And so in that case, I mean, these, these indicators were adequately met. I mean, maybe a little bit more work had been done to, for me to be able to kind of, uh, in a subjective way to say that they were strongly met, but generally speaking, um, it was, the design phase was thorough, it lasted several years and saw a wide range of stakeholders consulted locally and in the wider Caribbean region. Some under, and, indicator 1.3, some of the kind of human well-being outcomes. I mean, although these were identified in the project document, I don't think that they were thoroughly benchmarked. And they are being periodically assessed. There's a kind of an assessment mid-term, mid which has already happened, and now again at the end of the project. And so uh, I gave us a rating of adequate, you know, for, for, these, for this criterion. Criterion two, it's an interesting one, I feel. Um, it speaks to designing nature-based solutions, um, you know, that you have to really think about the scale of this solution. Um, are you recognizing and responding to the, the, the interactions between your NBS and between kind of the wider economy, society, and ecosystems? That's indicator 2.1. And indica indicator 2.2 and 2.3, speak to um, like complementary interventions and synergies across sectors and whether you did a kind of thorough risk assessment uh, before undertaking your nature-based solution. I think also that this one is very interesting for small island developing states because we all know that you know we have a small physical land mass, pretty small human resources. Um, and I, I think you know, in looking at these guiding questions and interactions between, you know, your intervention and the wider ecosystem, I think we could have done a lot more work. I think this criterion kind of calls us to, to look at the whole island ecosystem. When you're, even if you're just implementing in a particular area, that you should be really adopting this kind of systems thinking. And I think for small islands, um, this can work well for us because, you know, the system is rather small. But that being said, I think it takes a lot more time um, and effort in the design phase uh, to do that adequately. And so then you can see here that I, I gave us kind of an adequate, uh, I felt like two, indicator 2.1 was adequately fulfilled. But in terms of um, integration with similar projects and risk identification, uh, although these were done and you can see evidence of them in the project document, um, I think they're only partially done. I think more work would have needed to be done in order to consider wider interactions beyond the intervention sites. So let's move on to criteria three. I'm going to see if I can wrap up, you know, so we can have some time to talk, but uh, maybe another 10 minutes or so, and then we can have a discussion. Criterion three talks about a net gain to biodiversity. So this is something I think we would all naturally say, okay, well, if you're going to be implementing a nature-based solution, you've got to see that there was a net gain um, in biodiversity and ecosystems integrity. And there are four criteria um, in this area um, that are all related to uh, biodiversity outcomes and periodic assessments of any unintended adverse consequences and whether or not we took advantage of enhancing ecosystems integrity. So uh, at all three of our sites in uh, Nevis, for example, um, there was a substantial knowledge about the current state of the ecosystem and prevailing drivers of degradation. And these were all well-documented and all of our goals were clearly identified, benchmarked and assessed. And so I think as a result, you know, 3.1 and 3.2 um, were adequately met. Now, moving on to the, the, the next two indicators, which speak more about unintended adverse consequences and whether or not we really took the opportunity to um, identify synergies, but a bit kind of linked to criterion two. Uh, I, I think we probably had some lost opportunities here um, in terms of enhancing ecosystems connectivity, um, as these were not really identified, but I think they were viewed a bit of outside the scope of this project and would require more resources to fully flesh out and 
and analyze. But again, it kind of speaks back to this theme that in the case of small islands, um, you know, maybe we need to consider our whole island um, in the application of any nature-based solution, especially if we, we want to take full advantage of synergies and uh, really say something about ecosystems, integrity, and connectivity. So moving on to criterion four. So here you see some red. <laughs> so this criterion speaks to uh, nature-based solutions being eco economically viable, financially viable, for example. And there are four criteria across this one. And I thought this was a really interesting one um, because it speaks a lot to um, direct and indirect benefits and costs associated with the nature-based solution. You know, who pays, who benefits, are these things identified? Are they well documented? Is there a cost effectiveness study? Um, and I have to say that if you if you take a really close look at the project document and even the midterm review document, you'll see that we didn't spend a lot of effort. I think it was implicit, or it was we all implicitly. Ala, we seem to have lost you for a second. There had been done a many, You're many out. years ago. You're Am I running out of time? You, you just you just disappeared, man. Go ahead. Oh, I'm good? OK. Yep, yep. Uh, well, I'm almost done. Hopefully, we can make it. And so um, I really, um, I mean, of course, I think installing gabion baskets and planting of grass is cheaper than putting in a huge uh, culvert, you know, for example, in the college street cut. But and, and we all kind of knew this implicitly, but we didn't we didn't do explicitly um, a cost benefit analysis of this. Like there was no attempt to estimate an internal rate of return, nor like a meaningful review of of the cost effectiveness against other viable, um, you know, alternatives. And so that's why you see um, that basically a lot of these indicators were insufficiently met or only partially met. Um, yeah, so I'm going to leave that there for criterion four. Criterion five uh, is based on inclusive, transparent, and empowering, which I think is the key word here, governance processes. This one also, this one has actually five indicators. Um, but I think generally speaking, um, you know, it, it, is, it is speaking to stakeholder consultation, um, whether there are defined feedback and grievance resolution mechanisms for, you know, any stakeholders that feel like, um, you know, they're being left out. And so generally speaking, um, the governance process that was put in place at project inception was the establishment of a project steering committee, which was inclusive, transparent, and includes uh, stakeholders from all key groups, including NGOs, has fairly good gender balance. Um, and these were thoroughly mapped in a project document and project inception. We met at least once yearly, and I was basically in constant communication with members throughout the project lifetime. And so generally speaking, I think we did um, adequate, you know, in this criteria, we did fairly well. To achieve more inclusivity, we could have um, reached out maybe more fully to civil society and private sector, especially in terms of representation on the project steering committee. So let's move on to criteria six. So criteria six is closely tied to criteria four, and it speaks to balancing of trade-offs. Um, between achievement of the primary goal of the NBS and kind of continued provision of multiple benefits into the future. And like I said, it speaks a lot to, it builds on the costs and the benefits that should have been quantified under criteria four. And so basically, because we didn't really go through the, that exercise of a kind of strict um, detailed cost benefit analysis, um, we, we didn't, we insufficiently met a lot of these criterion um, related to balancing of trade-offs under criteria six. Now, criteria seven was one, I mean, this is originally how I got to learn about the, these guidelines. We learned a lot about adaptive management in this project, especially because we had to be implementing during the COVID-19 pandemic. And so criterion seven and all of its indicators are related to managing adaptively, being resilient, and having this being based on evidence kind of being able to implement something that's iter iterative and always learning, asking yourself questions, 
um, you know, looking at the evidence, making course adjustments and coming back again, this kind of feedback over and over again. And so we were forced to do this during the pandemic. So in cases where we thought we were going to have to rely on international consultants, we realized that no, we had to rely on local knowledge, local entities. And so in a way, our adaptive management kind of occurred organically and it, it grew out of consistent discussion with key stakeholders and the project steering committee. And it became a bit of like a new way of doing things for us and really helped the project uh, moving forward, not stalling during the pandemic. Um, and we wanted to share this with others. And so I gave a presentation on this to other project managers in the IW Eco Project. Um, yeah, so basically, of course, all of these were at, all of these criterion were adequately met. And so for the final criterion, number eight, this speaks to being about sustainability and mainstreaming within an appropriate jurisdictional context. And um, so on these, I, I think we did a fairly good job. It also speaks, it speaks to sharing of lessons learned um, and triggering of transformational change, which we all know is a hard one. But um, we did a lot of work in sharing widely, both in the country, regionally, various platforms, newsletters, articles, videos, infographics, social media pages, webinars like this one, conferences, uh, CWWA, we presented three papers there over the years. And all of these are nicely um, highlighted on the project website. As the project wraps up, we're looking to do a lot more of this type of sharing of lessons learned. And actually, this whole process and, and, and me doing this, um, this paper, writing this paper and doing this presentation was all part of sharing of the lessons learned. So that we could hopefully trigger transformational change, although, of course, these things take time. So here's kind of a snapshot overall, of kind of how we did. Now, the IUCN considers that if you have some criterion that you met insufficiently, that overall your intervention does not adhere to the global standard. So technically, we didn't adhere to the global standard. Um, but that being said, I, I do think that there was a lot, of, um, a lot of what we learned about our strengths and weaknesses, which I spoke to at length. And uh, I think a lot of strengths across criterion one, seven, and eight, and some weaknesses, of course, across uh, criteria four and six, and a, a lot to learn, especially in number two. So just to wrap up, and then we can have a nice discussion. Um, I think that this standard is incredibly useful. Um, it provides a very systematic way of kind of evaluating. I don't even want to use the word evaluating, um, but, but, you know, really kind of checking in, checking in on how things are going. So it, it's, it's, I think it might have been designed more for like when you're in the design phase, but I think it's equally useful during implementation. And it kind of aids in the whole um, iterative process that I was telling you about, this learning process of adaptive management, as it allows the users, if you keep asking yourself these guiding questions periodically, let's say quarterly, the user is able to kind of make course adjustments, um, you know, along with their kind of implementa implementation committee or uh, stakeholders. For, for small island developing states, I think the tool um, guides us um, in, in, in trying to really, really adopt kind of whole systems thinking. And in, in adopting the whole systems thinking, we should be looking at our entire island. In the case of St. Kitts and Nevis, this is six, 60 or 65 square kilometers. I mean, it can happen. It requires a lot of effort, um, time, as well as, as financial. But I think that the benefits would be more long lasting if we were to take the time to do that process of systems thinking. Um, I think going through the exercise, it reinforces the fact that nature-based solutions required sustained implementation and financing. I know Dr. Cashman will ask me a question about this. Um, you know, it's, it's not well, implementation of NBS is not well suited to short-term thinking or even short project timelines. I mean, a project like this, it's only three years. We're really only scratching the surface. We're only really at the start of this. It's really only piloting. And we wanna get beyond piloting. We wanna move into you know, replication and upscaling on our islands. Um, and in doing that, you know, if we can make that leapfrog, uh, not even leapfrog, if we can just grow from piloting and, and really expand the timelines of these projects and the financing that's available, I think that nature-based solutions would be a big player, like a key element to solving um, many of the kind of environmental problems that we have uh, on small island developing states and of course globally as well. 
So I'm going to leave it there. I'm going to thank you very, very much for this opportunity and we can chat. Hello, thank you. That was excellent. Uh, any questions or discussion points? I'm sure that uh, Adrian Cashman might have something. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm going to turn on my video so Adrian can see me. No, maybe not. Here he is. Hey, Adrian. <laughs> Uh, yeah, hi, Hala. Um, yeah, I, I just, th there's oh. so much that you've presented, and my apologies for coming in a little bit late. But there, as you say, there's so much that you've presented that um, uh, allows, you know, for, for discussion. But just I would uh, offer one observation, mm -hmm. um, and that is when you were talking about your cost benefit analysis, and you sort of knocked yourself a little bit in your evaluation by saying we haven't really met or gone very far with that criteria. And I would suggest that the, the, the reason is not that you've not met it, but you didn't have the opportunity to evaluate it. Because I think if you did do a cost-benefit analysis, uh, an economic cost-benefit analysis, as opposed to a uh, financial one, you would probably find with all the environmental benefits that you, you, you're going to be generating over years, that you would probably more, of, uh, more than adequately have uh, met that criteria. So I think uh, I would say you're being a little bit harsh on, your, on yourself uh, and the project um, in, in that respect. But it does highlight, I mean, you, you bringing it out, it does actually highlight, and if you look at the the weighting, I, I quickly looked at your weighting of that criteria. It's mm. actually one of the higher weighted criteria, over, for example, the social and and others. And you know, weightings have a way of skewing uh, interpret interpretation. So um, I think there's a debate that could be had around that because we're again we're privileging this idea of economics over people and environment in in a way so it's really an observation more than mm -hmm. more than a question to you there's lots that there's others i mean i could query um you said something about native species and you mentioned um uh, breadfruit trees well you know breadfruit trees were introduced by into the caribbean by captain Bly. so are they are really a native species yeah. Yeah. and what what uh, distinguishes a native from an invasive species? Because for example, southern cattails in Mexico are not necessarily uh, a looked at as an invasive species because they provide certain benefits. So, I mean, those are philosophical debates uh, <laughs> that, 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 that we can get into, but you no, know, thanks for a really great presentation. Thanks. Thanks, Adrian. I, um, I have to tell you that I, I spent a lot of time thinking about uh, Criterion 4. And I mean, I, I have some training, although a long time ago, I mean, I, I remember taking a whole course in university about cost benefit analysis. Uh, not, I mean, not just the traditional kind of hardcore economic one, but one that even takes the time, like a process that even takes the time to kind of try to quantify or at least qualitatively um, look at intangible benefits. Um, and I agree with you that um, uh, maybe I was a little bit harsh, but I, I, I think it was a bit of an opportunity lost. Now, you've, you've been through these project documents. I mean, they're, they're generally quite detailed, the Jeff um, project documents. And to tag on a kind of a, a cost benefit analysis, you know, might be really quite a bit of work. But um, I agree that if we had gone through this process, that actually there are, are, are quite a few, especially intangible benefits. Um, as long as you're taking those into account, I agree that over the long term, you know, we, we would have succeeded in a sense that I, I, I think the benefits outweigh the costs. Uh, but the fact is, is that it, it wasn't really done. Um, it was done maybe kind of in my head, uh, philosophically, or like in the <laughs> conversation. And we, we know these things. But but I think have to, to go through that. I mean, I wonder if it, uh, I wondered if like, oh, maybe this should be part of the, the whole uh, project design phase uh, of any project that's seeking. I, I think this is where IUCN is trying to take us that, hey, if you're gonna do this, you gotta be able to justify this to all types of people, including yeah. ones who only wear the economic hat. Mm -hmm. And if we're gonna do that, 
then we're, we should be utilizing this tool. And that's kind of how I took this criterion. Um, that, you know, if you're going to be crossing all your, your T's and dotting your I's, then you should go through this type of analysis because you're going to be, you should be able to prove, like you said, that the benefits will outweigh the, the costs, but it would take some, some time. Um, yeah. yeah, in terms of invasives and non-invasives, that's an interesting one. You know, there's a concurrent Jeff project happening right now in St. Kitts and Nevis um, on invasive alien species. It's also Jeff funded implemented by CABI out of Trinidad and Tobago. And um, the main invasive species that they chose in St. Kitts and Nevis to focus on was a green vervet monkey. Now, yeah. this is similar to breadfruit in a sense that, I mean, um, it was brought in, you know, whatever, two, 300 years ago uh, by the, the French or the English, I can't recall anymore. But what is an invasive and what, what isn't is, is totally kind of context specific. Uh, breadfruit is not considered an invasive species here, but the southern cattail totally is. Um, they, they're not even sure how it got here, but they think it was through like uh, importation of landscaping, um, you know, plants that are used for landscaping. Mm -hmm. um, but I agree that there's an interesting discussion to be had there. We had a long discussion, I recall, in one webinar about whether vetiver grass was an invasive species. Some people suggesting that once it, it grows, it grows out of control. But and I, I heard some very interesting, because I mean, you know me, I'm an engineer, water's my thing. So I heard this very interesting back and forth about even vetiver grass. But our local forestry officer is a strong proponent of it. And so uh, we went with local uh, knowledge and we utilized it. And so far, there's no indications that it's growing out of control. But anyways, we can chat some more. Yeah, thanks for your yeah. question. Uh, any other questions? Well, nothing in the chat. I, I have a couple. I, you brought up a really good point, Hannah. Uh, Hannah. Um, you, you brought this whole island connectivity. I think that's such an important thing in small island developing states. Here in uh, Toronto or where I live in Boston, you might be able to do that as a citywide uh, um, approach. Um, so based on that, so if you take a, uh, say in St. Kitts, a whole island approach, applying these, how do you well, there's two prongs to this because you talked about uh, criterion four and criterion eight. There's some <clears throat> interesting things there that aren't brought up. What do you do post project? Who who pays to maintain these? This is always a question we have on projects I work on. Like, and the other part is how do you uh, retrain the thinking of the old school engineer who has been taught hard structures instead of now integrating gray structure and green structure into their uh, into their daily work 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 life. So therefore, you best here gut has this great project. So why not just apply that through the island? Yeah, these are great questions, Aaron. Thanks. Um, okay, so the question about the whole systems thinking, I just want to kind of tap on that because I don't know, many of you wouldn't have known me back in the day, but like I uh, my PhD uh, thesis was basically about this. Um, I, I did an analysis of the entire urban water system of Toronto, and I was all about this systems thinking. And so my my thinking was like, oh, it will be so easy to just go to an island. You have this very clear boundary. You know what's coming in. You know what's coming out. Mm. And you should be able to, you know, you should be able to track these things. I was interested a lot in materials flow analysis and that sort of thing and life cycle assessment. Um, and in theory, I think for an island, there's so much we could take advantage to when it comes to systems thinking. Um, I don't think that, I mean, at least from a research perspective, um, academic perspective, on the ground, we're not really there. So all the silos that exist in kind of larger countries, you know, these exist here too. Even given this very small landmass and the fact that everybody knows each other, these, yeah. silos, these silos still exist, which I always found so, so fascinating. Maybe something else that Adrian can talk about later, but um, and I, I, I don't know. I'm not so clear on how it can happen, but I do know that, especially under the climate change portfolio, it's forcing the Department of Environment, for example, to become this kind of entity that's bringing everybody together. Because when you get to doing these greenhouse gas inventories, you start asking all these questions about what's coming in, what's coming out, you know. And I think we're taking very, very small steps towards this as a result. Um, in terms of who pays for it um, afterwards, of course, this is always a major problem. Yeah. Uh, I think of these Jeff projects. Um, 
And that's why, um, at least on a, quite a small scale, I, I tried to support, I mean, the, the fact that we worked with NGOs in Nevis kind of opened up a different modality for me in terms of implementation. Because in St. Kitts and Nevis, everything is generally very centrally managed, government, 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 government. Um, and so the opportunity to work with NGOs was kind of enlightening to me. And I, I think that um, there's a lot to take advantage of there. And I think that they were well positioned after having done this work to um, you know, seek additional funding. And so we do have two cases where the NHCS received additional funding to do more work at Nelson Spring and where CARE SKN is going to do more work in coral, reef, uh, coral uh, nursery monitoring. And both of these entities are well supported by the central government. So uh, I think they'll be able to do their work um, and, and have all partners be involved. In terms of teaching and kind of changing the mindset from hard infrastructure to you know, gray, green, nature-based solutions, I think um, a lot of that happens kind of organically in a sense that um, now that things are happening and you see them on the ground and they're, um, you know, they're, they're showing some, some uh, positive um, outcomes, I, I think that's the only way really to change the minds. Of course, we've done quite a bit of training as well. Um, there's a whole other aspect I didn't speak to where we did a, a study of the minerals, like how we do quarrying and how we do sand mining in St. Kitts and Nevis. Um, and that had a whole training um, uh, modules related to rehabilitation of quarry sites and how you do that effectively. Um, and so we tried to touch on that. Um, that's almost a whole project also in and of itself. But I'd like to think that it speaks for itself and that it yeah. changed minds just by, by the fact that it's, it's, you know, it's there and it uh, would continue to have positive outcomes into the future. If I, if I can um, just sort of take what Hull has been saying about, you know, changing mindsets um, and take it maybe a little bit further. Um, I think one of one of my issues with with uh, with projects, large regional projects, is that we build up uh, through the projects a whole a whole bunch of of, of knowledge um, and and experience. And at the end of the project, uh, once the funding's gone away, um, there's a a very not just I was going to say a real danger, but it, it, it actually happens is that we act, we lose we lose a lot of that knowledge and knowledge and experience. It just resides in a small number of a small number of people, people like color. So we have to if we're going to change mindsets, we have to look at how we can disseminate, give it a life after after projects and. I think you know, this is a particular uh, maybe hobby horse of mine. I think this is where regional organizations that have a pres that have an ongoing presence uh, offer us an opportunity, whether it's Global Water Partnership Caribbean or Caribbean Water and Wastewater Association um, or, or CAPNET, Caribbean CAPNET. Um, I think, you know, there are op there are untapped opportunities to use the to use this material to and disseminate and give it a life after after projects and you know even then filtering that into postgraduate courses and things like that because that is a way of you know the people going through the postgraduate courses at our universities and, and community colleges they're the ones that are possibly more receptive to the to new ideas and can be advocates. And I've seen this happen, you know, uh, over the last decade and a half, you know, how people expose, uh, um, postgraduate students exposed to new ideas, new ways of thinking, have taken that on board and gradually as they've gone through their professions, as they've developed in their career, they've started to be, they've been advocates for that. So uh, it's just taking Heller's point and maybe ruminating on, you know, what the possibilities are. Thanks.